Good evening. Sorry, I've had some technical difficulties. And I, I hope now this is live and that you can see and hear what I'm working on. I want to talk tonight about the blessings of redemption from the book of Ephesians. I've done this a uh, couple of times now, except it just wasn't working right. So hopefully the third time is the charm. Now, last week we talked about 2 Timothy, about God wants us to be faithful because the God who called us is faithful. He wants us to be strong in him, not in ourselves. He wants us to be wise. That's chapter three, to discern false and true Christianity and four, to be committed to him. Tonight, I want to talk about what it means to be redeemed the blessings of redemption that are found in Ephesians chapter number one, starting in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Do we think about what our blessings are in Christ? Do we think about these spiritual blessings blessings? Are we sometimes too earthly minded that we're no heaven, heavenly good or too heavenly minded that we're no earthly good? You know, we have to strike a balance because God has put us here. We are here on this earth. We are located where we are and we are located there to be a servant for God. And it says that he has blessed us with only some spiritual blessings, a few. No, the text says every spiritual blessing. And Paul just chooses a few to talk about in the first chapter of Ephesians. First, he says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, that word is called election. God chose us. Does that mean God elected some for heaven and some for hell? I don't buy that. I don't buy that that's true because then how do you get John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Peter talks about the fact that God's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. The fact is, I believe God chose, it says God chose us in him before the God, or just as he, God, chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. Salvation was God's plan before he ever even created, because God knew what was going to happen. God knew what was going to happen. He had a plan for it. Christ is, in Revelation, called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And then the Holy Spirit executes the idea of bringing us into the family of God. God has a plan. Jesus bought, had bought us by his blood, by his sacrifice, by his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit brings us into this salvation. And what does it say here? He chose us before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. Now, some of you may have China that you have set apart. You may have it in a china cabinet. You may have it in boxes. You may have it somewhere in a cabinet someplace, like I have cabinets behind me. And it's only used for special occasions. It's not daily wear. It's not to be used every day. It's, in a sense, holy to you. It's set apart. That's what God has done for you. He has set you apart. But he wants to use you. And what, is it, what else does it say? Blameless. Blameless means that there is not a charge that can be laid against 
the, the son or daughter of God that he hasn't forgiven. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He comes out and he attacks you. He goes, to, he goes before God and says, have you seen what that guy did? Have you seen what she did? Did you hear what she said or he said? God does not remind us of our past sins. As far as the east is from the west, I have cast thy transgressions, the Lord says, and I will remember them no more. We are blameless before him. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, he owns us. And what God has done is he forgives us and he doesn't, he holds us blameless. The judge gavel comes down, not guilty. Now in verse five, it says, in love he predestined us to an adoption, to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus in himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Again, predestination. Does God predestine some for heaven, some for hell? No, predestination is solely for the Christian. He predestined us to be adopted as sons, sons and daughters of God. In the Greco- Roman world, when an individual of, of high status had a son, that son was raised by a slave. That son was tutored, taught by this slave. And at a certain age, this son was presented to the father, and the father would then adopt, make it official that this is my child. Well, God has done that for us through Jesus Christ. We, as Paul says, we have the ability to come to God and call him Daddy. Abba. There is nothing that you can't go to God with and talk to him about. There is nothing you can't go to Daddy and talk to him about. Now, Paul explains predestination a little more in detail in Romans 8. In Romans 8, verses 29 and 30, I'll stick with just the first part of 29. Because those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he should be firstborn among many brothers. We are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, period. I call it character building, and it is a painful process. The amount of pain that we go through is really based on us. Will we conform to what God is doing in our lives, or will we fight? There's an example of this in the book of Jeremiah. God calls Jeremiah, tells him to go to the potter's house, and the potter is sitting at at the wheel, you know, his foot's going, he's got that wheel turning, and he's got this lob, a blob of clay on the wheel, and it's spinning, and he's fashioning it into some kind of a vessel. And while he's doing this, sometimes it happens with the clay that uh, it flops. Sometimes the, the one who is making it, you know, if he, made, if he or she made a mistake, and moved their hand a different way, Sometimes that clay can just drop. And what they have to do is pound it back into a ball and start all over. And God asked Jeremiah a question. Can I not do with you, O Israel, as the potter does with the clay? We sing it. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting yielded and still? Are we really allowing ourselves to be clay in the hands of the master potter? That's what predestination is, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to his kind intention of his will, to the, to the praise of his glory. 
and his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. God has given us grace. He calls us beloved. You know, I'm on my fingers here. I have two wedding rings. This was my Uncle Bill's. He's a godly Christian man. This is my original wedding ring. If I try to get it up close, um, you're not going to be able to see much detail on it because it's pretty much been rubbed out. I, we've been married this November. I'll be 35 years. And it shows you how much weight I've gained that I can no longer wear my wedding ring on my ring finger. But I use this as a reminder of my, to myself. This is the ring right here. This is the ring... I married my wife with this is the this is the ring where you know it's, it's my reminder that I'm married to Christ he's lavished us with grace he has made known to us the mystery of his will what is God's will what is God's will for your life and for my life well first off it's to be conformed to the image of his son. He wants us to be becoming more and more like Jesus. And it's going to take the, our entire lifetime. And we're still not going to be there. It won't happen until we, we die and we see him face to face. But that's not the excuse to be used to not continue to press on. He's made known to us the mystery of his will. And there is a mystery that Paul talks about in chapter number two, that mystery that is revealed there that was hidden in the Old Testament. And that is that the Jew and Gentile would be one in Christ, that there would be no Jew or Greek, male or female, that they all are one in Christ according to his kind intention, which he purposed uh, in him, in Christ. In verse 11, it says, we've also obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. We have an inheritance in God, in Christ. And remember John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. We have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. And we are an inheritance for Jesus Christ. He's purchased us. He owns us. He, we belong to him. Now look at verse 13. In him, you also have to, after listening to the message of truth, the, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you listened to a message and you wedded that listening with belief and something happened. It says you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. That seal is the wedding ring. That is the promise of your redemption. That God is coming back to take you home. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge for our inheritance with a view to redemption, to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory.
He's chosen you. He's predestined you to be conformed to his image. He has revealed to you, he's lavished grace, he's redeemed and forgiven, lavished grace, given you his will. Now let's talk about will for just a minute. Some of you may really struggle with God's will. I did. I did big time. At age 50, I was laid off. I had worked for Moody, for Moody Bible Institute for a total of 18 years, and I got laid off. My job was divided out between other people. And here I am, 50 years old, have a doctor of education, 18 years experience, can't get a job. And then on top of that, my health started to fail to the point that I'm on disability now. I kept asking God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Lord, what am I to do? And I was asking the wrong question. Because the question is, what do you want me to be? I was like Martha, you know, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, they were at Jesus. Jesus was at their house. Jesus was teaching. There was a group of people there and Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And Martha was in the kitchen making lunch, dinner. She was cooking. She was angry. Jesus, tell my sister Mary to come in here and help me. Martha, 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 you worry about so many things. But Mary has chosen her part and it will not be taken away from her. Martha forgot who Jesus was. She forgot that he, he's the one that turned water into wine. He's the one that fed thousands with a few loaves and a few fish. They didn't need to be, they didn't need to worry about what they were going to eat. What do we worry about? What are we concerned with? I was concerned about a job. I was concerned with trying to provide for my family as if God needed my help to provide for my family. God didn't need my help. God doesn't need anything. And it took too many years, a good five, six years for me really to to it for it to finally hit home god is more concerned with who i'm becoming than what i'm doing the doing will take care of itself who i am becoming in christ there's his will who are you becoming in christ He wants to conform you into his image. He's redeemed you and forgiven you to get you into his image. He's lavished grace upon you to get you into his image. He's revealing his will to you to get you into his image. He's given you an inheritance for you to to live in when you're fully in his image. And then he sealed you with the Holy Spirit, the promise that he's not done with you.
What are you asking of God? What are you wanting God to do for you right now? Is there an aspect of God's will that you are struggling with? Is there past sin that you you just are having such a difficult time getting over? I hope that you will consider these things tonight. I hope you will just open your heart up to the Lord and let him minister to you through these words. You may not have much here, but you have an inheritance. Hang on to it. God's hanging on to you. Do not let go. The Holy Spirit is there for you to hold on to, for him to teach you, for him to draw you closer. He has sealed you. He has given you gifts. You are God's own possession. Don't let Satan rob you of the things that God has done. Satan lies, he murders. And if he can't murder you physically, he'll try to murder your testimony. He'll try to murder your joy. Read over these things from Ephesians 1. Remind yourself of what God has done on your behalf because of his love and to the praise of his own glory. Now for a commercial, if I may, we're in my garage. My son and daughter-in-law live with us right now and they've taken one of the rooms is, would be my study. In my garage here are tools. I work with wood and I have a, another Facebook page. It's called LJH Crafts and Decorations. And if there's something that I can make for you, just let me know. Look at the pictures of things that I've done. And if there's something there, or if you have an idea of something that you would like. And also for those who are in Northwest Indiana who are watching, um, I have a booth in a place called The Empty Nest. It's in Griffith on Main Street. You can go in and see th some of the things that I've made there. And the second commercial is that I've written a book, and it's called Your Spiritual House. It's available on Amazon. It's in paperback and digital. And right now it is being worked on as an audio book. So hopefully before the end of the year, the audio book will be out. I don't have the equipment right now to, to do that myself, so I'm having it done. Until next time, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good night.